you so much for this kind introduction. You already gave a very positive summary, basically, of the gist of my talk, I think. So thank you so much. And also thank you for the patience and support when Utopia Today, and I cursed using this title when it happened, turned out to be Utopia Next Year because I was ill when, this, when the talk was scheduled for the first time. So many thanks for being here today and my apologies for any inconvenience. The Oxford English Dictionary tells us, for example, that Utopian is now also used in neutral or positive sense. This indication of time, now, leads us to the question of the historicity of meaning and of utopia. Despite seeming like a timeless idea removed from history, its meaning, of course, changes with time. So it is also possible, as the OED already indicates, to reclaim the word utopian from its negative associations. And this might be important. Language, of course, influences thought and thus ultimately practice. Language is practice, if you like. Why we need a positive view of utopia today and how utopian practices in a non-utopian world could be conceived is the main issue of my talk. For this, today I suggest to go back to a tradition of utopia which is concerned with the political economies of the social worlds it criticizes and imagines differently. Speaking about utopia often appears almost embarrassing. Utopian ideas seem excessive or naive, or themselves tending towards their opposite, dystopia, totalitarianism. Realism and to be realistic is invoked as the opposite of utopianism. But is that such a clear opposition? I would say no. If we look at reality today, at the political economy and social realities of capitalism, excessive can be seen as one of its main characteristics. Excessive in its use and exploitation of resources, of nature, non-human and human. But surely it's not naive to be pragmatically realistic. Realistic scenarios for the future are obviously derived from what is already present today. Climate catastrophe, increased risk of pandemics and wars over dwindling resources, pressure because of land becoming uninhabitable and barren, and so on. Hence to think that it is politically realistic that things can go on as they are and pragmatic solutions will be found within the existing framework is indeed itself naive. It is clear that climate catastrophe will cause drastic changes for which there are no realistic answers as yet. So one could say that realism today is either naive or it means to accept more or less dystopic scenarios of scarcity, conflict and suffering. Also, to insist that pragmatic realism, understood in opposition to ideas of radical change, is the only rational worldview, is itself a totalitarian attitude. It sets the status quo as an absolute. Rather than utopia being an absolute ideal, the real appears absolute in such a perspective. Realism in this sense, today, is always economic realism within the existing setup. It is capitalist realism, as cultural theorist Mark Fisher called it. Therefore, it is not, as the word realism may suggest, a neutral orientation towards reality, but an ideological framework blocking other perspectives on reality. Can utopia be a perspective on reality? I would say yes. And hence, utopia can also become a practice. In order to reclaim such a positive and practical sense of utopia, it is, however, important to engage with prevalent critical views. So in this talk, I will try to develop utopian perspectives, partly by discussing critical aspects. Let's start with the beginning of the word utopia. Thomas More's invention has profoundly influenced the notion of imagining better political systems until today, especially through the word utopia and through placing utopia on an island. More created the name for his imagined place from Greek, ou and topos, which means no place or nowhere. The word can also be interpreted as a pun with Greek eu topos, eu topos in English, the good place. The name thus emphasizes the fictional status of this good place, even though it is described as a real place by More's narrator or the character who narrates Utopia, he traveled to Utopia. The name itself carries this tension between the concrete reality of a place, 
topos. Sorry, I didn't do this. And its negation, utopos. Utopia is fictional, but is a concrete fiction. The fiction of a non-existent society which could exist, which might be placed somewhere instead of nowhere. And Bloch's concept of concrete utopia makes this explicit. Utopia is the concrete imagination of a better social political world, not a dreamlike paradise or magical land of cocaine, but a world which functions according to the rules of possibility. The predominant negative view of utopia as impractical instead focuses on its irreality, its removal from existing places and historical time. And this is often connected to the imaginary of utopia as an island. The island as a separate sphere where everything is ordered nicely and autonomously is of course a very compelling image and has been incredibly successful in the Western cultural imaginary. At the same time, it is linked to negative views of utopia. The perfect place detached from the rest of the world and hence unattainable, an enclosed space of a totalizing ideal, imagined as indeed islands often tend to be, as removed not only in space but also in time, a timeless, unchangeable ideal. Island utopia is seen as a self-enclosed space, following its own rules disconnected from the developments of history and the complexities of the social political world at large. However, if we look at this famous illustration of utopia, it already suggests that a different reading of island utopia is possible. The ships in the foreground emphasize the connectivity of the sea. The settlement on the shore in the background shows the proximity of utopia to other countries. And indeed, Moore's narrator also talks about this. Island utopia can thus be seen as both separated from and connected to the outside world. As any island, it is characterized as much by openness and connection with its surrounding waters as by enclosure. Moore's island, however, is not a natural but an artificial island. Not only on the level of being a fictional invention, but also within the narrative. Utopia is separated from the mainland through a political decision and through human labor. This double artificiality of the man-made fictional island is significant because it highlights the creative act of utopia. Utopian thought, of course, stands for imaginative experimental ideas. And even more fundamentally, utopian drafts of alternative social political worlds highlight the fact that human history is always man-made in the act interaction between man and non-human nature, like the creation of an island from a peninsula. Human practices and ideas shape landscapes and places. They make history and, of course, societies and politics. But this is not always fully understood. Until today, the social world is often experienced as one of necessities. Even when the conditions are man-made, results appear as inevitable, and given realities are often referred to as natural. In this way, for example, economic crises are framed like natural catastrophes, not as the results of a specific economic system, which we could change, but as an inevitable consequence of human activities. Similarly, poverty, for example, appears as a natural given that can be fought, but not as something, something that has been caused in the first place. The proverbial widening gap between rich and poor is viewed like a self-propelling phenomenon, which indeed it is within capitalism, but not in any way within nature or the human condition. Utopian thought, in contrast, insists that we can imagine otherwise, and that through political decisions and human labor in the broadest sense, we can create different conditions for our societies and hence different societies. Social worlds which seem utopian only as long as the perspective of the established status quo is set as absolute. Like Moore's artificial island, all social conditions are man-made and therefore open to change and planned improvement. Of course, there can be unplanned negative consequences and effects arising from established conditions or from newly created conditions. But then these can be taken into account when planning change for the better. There can always be conscious change, small or fundamental change, a departure from the established continent of social conditions towards new ones. <laughs>
Thomas More's description of the conscious separation of utopia from the mainland, however, is also an example of where this seminal utopian text itself, unless we read some irony or satire here, itself remains tied to assumptions of its own time, which would not seem utopian today. The foundation of utopia in Thomas More's narrative is marked by a classic act of imperial conquest, colonization and autocratic power. I quote, this was no island at first, but part of the continent, Utopos, that conquered it, whose name it still carries, for Abraxa was its first name, brought the rude and uncivilized inhabitants into such good government and to that measure of politeness that they now far excel the rest of mankind. Having soon subdued them, he designed to separate them from the continent and to bring the sea quite round them. To accomplish this, he ordered a deep channel to be dug. It is important to highlight this colonialist aspect of Moore's invention of utopia, because it is a strong reminder of the fact that, indeed, there is no no man's land in which a utopian society could be created. Utopia has to start from the conditions already established, even if it sets out to, to depart from them. And it has to be built with the people currently living in non-utopian societies. Moore's notion of a good ruler who conquers and subdues uses what was to remain the typical justification of colonial powers for centuries, bringing good government and politeness to formerly rude and uncivilized people. Significantly, but only in passing, the narrator also mentions the erasing of the former name of the country, also a typical act of colonial appropriation. While in many ways Thomas More's fiction radically deviates from political realities of his time, in this respect, as well as some others, Moore's utopia does not leave behind already existing ideologies, as any utopian vision partly will, and therefore needs to be viewed in its historical context. And each utopia has to be criticized again and again from new vantage points. Utopia cannot be a stable blueprint, but has to keep changing itself. China Mieville, a utopian author of our times, provocatively points out in his introduction to, the, to a recent English edition of Utopia, which I've been using. I quote, A start for any habitable utopia must be to overturn the ideo ideological bullshit of empire and unsentimentally but respectfully to revisit the traduced and defamed cultures on the bones of which some conqueror's utopian dreams were piled up. In this way, current utopian thought also has the task of decolonizing the utopian tradition. This means not to impose a Eurocentric worldview, which even permeates utopia as the imagined other of real politics, where Euro and Western centrism is still predominant anyway. It means to radically democratize utopia by critically analyzing those structures of power and exclusion, which influence even the cultural imaginary of better worlds. Reflecting on this passage from utopia also highlights the problem of imposing better political conditions by decree from above and through acts of power and submission. In variation of China Mieville's statement, I would also say that a start for any habitable utopia must be to overturn power hierarchies and submission, a democratic liberation from below, not the bringing of good government from above. So indeed, there can be no blueprint for utopia, and neither should there be any. Utopia needs to be processual. The utopian tradition itself has to be viewed critically. But does this mean we should abandon utopia? To abandon the journey to utopia would mean to abandon the idea of change for the better the idea at the basis of human culture, really. That is the idea that mankind can make things, including political institutions, for its own benefit, and the idea that everyone could be included in this benefit. Utopia, despite the imperial beginnings in Moore's narrative, carries the notion of being a better world for all. At least there's a long and rich emancipatory tradition of utopian thought which has this idea as its basis. From this perspective, 
better social worlds designed for the few, for an elitist withdrawal from the rest of the world, a notion of an enclosed island utopia shutting itself off from its surrounding waters is a dystopian inversion of the utopian impulse. Abandoning utopia or reserving it for select groups means to abandon the idea of a good life for mankind. Or as Oscar Wilde famously and brilliantly put it, you may know this quote, a map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth even glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. And when humanity lands there, it looks out and seeing a better country sets sail. Wilde both insists on the importance of utopia and on the importance of its constant remaking. Utopia always remains the no place in relation to each place. It remains the vantage point of a critical perspective on any status quo achieved. It can be argued that Thomas More was also already aware of this. The complex narrative structure of his fictional text, including dialogues between different characters, subtle ironies and satire, this hardly provides a simple ideal of politics, but rather instigates critical reflection and an active imagination on the part of the reader and questions towards the text, questions towards utopia. Therefore, as I have stressed, utopianism in a positive sense cannot consist in what is rightly seen critically, a blueprint of a fixed aim of historical change, tending towards the totalitarian and imposed from above. Perhaps somewhat surprisingly, this critical view of utopian visions was also purported by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. While many anti-utopian attitudes are combined with anti-socialist or anti-communist views, Marx and Engels themselves were opposed to utopianism. In the Communist Manifesto, they, pos they position their own political agenda against what they refer to as utopian socialism. Like many later critics of utopia, Marx and Engels also see utopian ideas as detached from historical developments and social realities. Instead of what they consider as mere intellectual fantasies of a better world, Marx and Engels, as is well known, emphasize the appearance of a new social order in the process of class struggle. A better social political world would thus be created from below and in practice, not through the implementation of a utopian theory. More recent approaches to utopia in fact agree with this critique and conceive utopia as linked to concrete historical conditions and existing social movements. And many current utopian approaches are also linked to a Marxian understanding of capitalism and class society. Indeed, as I will argue, utopia and communism have many things in common, even going back to Thomas More. Let me start with a short remark on Marxism. As was already mentioned, I had the pleasure of being able to write about Marxism and utopian thought for this nice issue of Share magazine, which had posed the question, is Marxism still relevant? Now we can ask two questions. Is Marxism and is utopianism still relevant? Like utopian thought, Marxism provides a perspective which allows us to look beyond the present social order. For this reason, I argue, as may have become clear, that both are highly, highly relevant today. They offer a perspective for the critical analysis of the present and for conceiving alternatives. And as I will highlight further, they both show how a change in the material basis of societies in their economies is essential for making different and better, more equal, more democratic and happier social worlds possible. As with utopia, of course, negative associations with Marxism and the ideas of socialism and communism have to be reflected on in order to make the concepts useful again for a positive view of a desirable future. For this, I would like to recommend a book which has recently been translated into English from German, Bine Adamczak, Yesterday's Tomorrow, which poses the idea of a reconstruction of the future. Adamczak, a contemporary political theorist, confronts the memories of when revolutions under the banner of communism violently turned against their own supporters, especially during Stalinism. <clears throat> 
But she does not use this as an argument against the revolutionary aims themselves, but as a necessary reflection and mourning memory of past failures and histories of repression and violence, as a step in being able to reconstruct those possible futures destroyed in the turn to repression. So besides the critical analysis of the current status quo, a critical analysis of past and present attempts at better worlds, or better worlds in inverted commas, is important for the development of ideas for alternative futures, a self-critical reflection, which is part of a democratic process, including an awareness of harmful justifications of sacrifices in the name of an ideal, which is a dangerous turn a political system can take when a specific better world is proclaimed. If the democratic process of critique and of creating better conditions for all ends in the declaration of an achieved ideal that is defended at all costs, utopia ends. Because the search for a better world ends in an authorita authoritarian declaration of arrival. However, this is also true when the existing social order is described as the best of all possible worlds and alternative visions are dismissed. This means cementing a system which is structurally based on inequality and on the exploitation of man and nature and a system with its own deadly consequences, for example, at national borders, and with the numerous early avoidable deaths from lower class status related to malnutrition, higher risk of disease, bad working conditions, higher exposure to environmental destruction and pollution, and so on. The critical analysis of how this system works is what Marx puts into focus. Like Utopia, insisting on man-made history, Marx's analysis reveals the structural but human workings of capitalism. Countering the widespread view that these workings are inevitable, their structure being derived from the nature of things or human nature, Marx demonstrates how we are indeed trapped in the structures of the political economy of capitalism, but not ineluctably and not altogether in the same way, but in fundamentally different ways because of the decisive class differences. With Marx, the importance of a change, not merely of the political system or of social relations or of individuals, but of the economic basis, comes into the foreground. His critique of the political economy of capitalism entails a critique of private property. Not private property in the sense of personal belongings or private living spaces, but in the sense of an economic system based on the competition between private economic actors and on the exclusion of the many from property. What socialism instead advocates is common property. We could also say the abolition of property. So common property of resources, of the means of production and of the goods which are socially produced, as well as a democratic organization of labor, including reproduction and care. And in fact, a critique of private property and imaginings of a shared use of the material wealth of societies, of common ownership and cooperation, are also at the core of the utopian tradition. The question of the economy and its basis in the system of property is already a central topic in Thomas More's Utopia. Its historical background is the era of the early beginnings of capitalism. And we can say that since the age of capitalism, unsurprisingly, utopias have tended to be anti-capitalist. Moore's narrator refers to the contemporary situation in England at the time of what Marx later analyzed as primitive accumulation. This was the basis on which capitalism was able to unfold. I will now quote a passage from Utopia which critically characterizes the historical realities in England using the interesting metaphor of man-eating sheep to describe the process of enclosure at the time of the transition between feudalism and capitalism. This was a form of land privatization which brought about mass evictions and poverty among the lower classes. In the words of Thomas More's narrator, the increase of pasture by which your sheep, which are naturally mild, 
may be said now to devour men and to unpeople not only villages but towns. For wherever it is found that the sheep of any soil yield a softer and richer wool than ordinary, there the nobility and gentry, and even those holy men, the abbots, not contented with the old rents which their farms yielded, stopped the course of agriculture, destroying houses and towns, and enclosed grounds that they may lodge their sheep in them. The enclosure of land meant the establishment of land as exclusive private property and an end to other, albeit themselves not ideal, forms of communal land ownership and collective land use. What Moore's narrator jokingly blames on the sheep as destructive forces actually happened. Rural communities were displaced and whole villages destroyed. And of course, we can think of many seemingly profitable sheep today, that is, forms of economic exploitation, <coughs> which devour those spaces and forms of life that do not seem economically relevant. So, <coughs> In Utopia, Moore describes the social consequences of this type of appropriation of land, leading many to such poverty that they either had to steal or beg. Both practices were criminalized. Moore's narrator opposes this situation to that of Utopia, where private property has been abolished, and hence such crimes are inexistent. He declares, sorry, As long as there is any property, and while money is the standard of all other things, I cannot think that a nation can be governed either justly or happily. Not justly, because the best things will fall to the share of the worst men. Nor happily, because things will be de divided among a few. Even these are not in all respects happy, the rest being left absolutely miserable. In Utopia, then, there is no property and work is organized collectively, with everyone choosing a profession they prefer besides agriculture, which everyone learns about. The working day has been reduced to six hours. This is possible because everyone works and unnecessary work arising from the logic of profit making has been abolished. Among other things, this relates to construction work and land use, which is rather topical today. Utopians rarely build, I quote, on a new piece of ground, but they take great care to preserve and repair existing buildings with very little labor. The democratic organization of work in Utopia has the aim of reducing working hours whenever possible. The magistrates never engage the people in unnecessary labor, since the chief end of the constitution is to regulate labor by the necessities of the public and to allow people as much time as is necessary for the improvement of their minds, in which they think, the utopians think, the happiness of life consists. Equality thus encompasses the material equality achieved through the abolition of private property, but also the important aspect of everyone having free time and the opportunity to develop their mind, material and intellectual equality, if you like. Of course, the two are always connected, and it is one of the big scandals how class society until today divides people radically in terms of material wealth and at the same time in terms of access to education, free time, and the energy for intellectual development or other occupations people may wish to pursue or develop in culture, sports, crafts, etc. This is an example of how material equality and freedom are connected. In contrast, to the ideology, in contrast to the ideology of private property, which sees property as a basis for individual choice and freedom, the utopian tradition explores different notions and practices of freedom. In the text, The Soul of Man Under Socialism, which I already quoted, Oscar Wilde, who is perhaps a surprising proponent of socialism, Wilde insists that after the abolition of private property, Individual development, what he calls individualism, will be far freer, far finer, and far more intensified than it is now. I am talking of the great actual individualism, latent and potential in mankind generally. <coughs> 
a potential that would be able to unfold in more utopian conditions. The critique of private property flags the relation between equality and freedom, and this is a point I emphasize, because anti-socialist and anti-utopian views often associate equality with a lack of freedom. However, quite to the contrary, inequality is of course linked to the impossibility of individual freedom in terms of material means and free time. For many, working days have become longer instead of shorter, as Thomas More already conceived it. And of course, there is a massive difference between the means to act freely. If I have no money, I have very little choice. Unless such sadly topical questions are seriously considered a matter of free choice. Should I heat or eat? The idea of equality does not mean the creation of, the, of a totalitarian collective of homogenous people, as some critical views of socialism and utopia depict it. It means more scope for individual choices, free development and time. But what about political freedom and democracy? Does a system of common property not necessarily tend towards totalitarianism? While endorsing socialism in combination with what he calls individualism, as we have heard, Oscar Wilde already warns of an industrial barrack system or a system of economic tyranny and authoritarian socialism. Indeed, real existing socialism has often been exactly that. So yes, I'm talking about a utopian concept in the sense of something that has not existed yet, at least not on a larger scale and for a longer period of time, but something that is not outside of all probability. A democratic organization of work and production, which we heard in Thomas More's words, many utopian thinkers have drafted. Indeed, the idea of common property in a utopian view is not the idea of state property, nor the idea of planning from above. Instead, a utopian concept of a different economic system is based on the idea of extending democracy to the economy. To mention, to mention just one further famous example, the same is true for William Morris's utopia, News from Nowhere. Morris describes the democratic setup of a future utopian England. In the following passage, a utopian character explains democracy to the narrator who comes from historical England, and the utopian sharply criticizes parliament, as we also know it. Was not the parliament on the one side a kind of watch committee sitting to see that the interests of the upper classes took no hurt? And on the other side, a sort of blind to delude the people into supposing they had some share in the management of their own affairs? In contrast to this, democracy in Morris' utopia is made up from below, with neighborhood councils deciding about work, the shaping of their own environments, such as building and infrastructure, etc. Decision-making is based on democratic deliberation and majority rule only comes into force after all other possibilities for consensus or compromise have been explored. Yes, it sounds utopian. But at the same time, is this not the very idea that already underlies all democracies? Should we not explore this essential idea of human communication and decision-making further? Morris utopian society has also done away with nations. The whole system of rival and competing nations which played so great a part in the government of the world of civilization has disappeared along with the inequality betwixt man and man in society. The irony in this explanation of the inhabitant of utopian nowhere is clear. The name of government does not deserve to be given to this hardly beneficial competition between territorial political units. Can we really not imagine or practice otherwise? It becomes clear that a utopian democratization goes far beyond democracies as we know them today. In capitalism, besides competing nations on the macro level, there are mostly competing private actors whose separate aims of profit making primarily shape their activities. This is not their individual decision, but an economic necessity, a precondition for participating in capitalist economy. Unprofitable businesses, businesses do not survive. Instead of this competition in a utopian economy, there would be democratic planning and cooperation. 
the utopian aims would be a good life for all and a livable planet for all, non-human nature included, both of which the current system not only not achieves, but hinders. Like utopia, like communism, the notion of a planned economy is historically tainted by concepts of rigid state planning. But this is not the idea of planning at the heart of the utopian conception of economies. Indeed, it is worth to reclaim the idea of planning in this context. Surely in other spheres, planning would not seem to be something negative, but exactly what we should be doing. So why not in this extremely important field of the economy, of what we make, what we shape, what we do? The idea of sustainability is widely accepted, but in order for any human activity to, to be sustainable, really, planning is crucial. And how can we think we live in democracies when the material basis of our lives, production and reproduction, and the time and energy we spend on these, work, are not democratically organized and planned, but are the results of competition and systematically conflicting interests. Interests such as between, say, the fossil fuel or the car industry and the sustainable production of energy and mobility. And also, of course, the structural differences between employers who need to lower costs and employees who need decent wages and good working conditions. What William Morris particularly focused on was precisely this, the development of work as a pleasant and fulfilling human activity. This is also his answer to a common counter argument against the abolition of wage labor, namely that people would not work at all without it. In contrast, people in Morris' utopian society see work as pleasure, either direct pleasure in creating something or seeing a positive effect, or more indirectly, the pleasure in a social activity known to be useful for the community and thus for oneself. Wouldn't we all wish to work in such conditions? Automation then is used to make work easier and as much as possible to do away with hard, unpleasant and dangerous work. In contrast, of course, automation here and now can be a threat to employment and is almost solely used to increase profit rates, not to improve working conditions. The focus on making work more enjoyable also extends to the domestic sphere, where we come to an aspect of utopian thought particularly relevant to feminism. The reorganization of what is called reproduction, the work connected to, for example, food preparation, child rearing, care, in a very broad sense. Let me mention in this context another lesser known example of utopian fiction, but equally fascinating. Herland is a feminist utopia and as such stands in a less known but no less important tradition of utopian thought. Also often focusing on what is defined as the sphere of women in our societies. If this is included in a democratic organization, it means that supplying for life and individual well-being, care in the broadest sense, becomes a joint effort. This does not mean an end to all spaces of intimacy, but the chance to organize collectively what is now relegated to private effort based on unequal means, which often leads to the fact that women are especially exploited in the sphere of paid labor in combination with the sphere of domestic labor. Now, gender relations and utopia could be the topic for a whole other talk, and it should be. As well as utopian texts written by women, feminist utopias, queer utopias, utopias coming from the global south, black utopias. So there's material for a whole series of talks. As I said, the utopian tradition itself needs to be decolonized and also feminized and diversified. What I have focused on today, however, has been an emancipatory tradition of utopia very well established within Western cultural tradition, also rather male. I thus continued the Western and masculine bias. This was meant as a way of demonstrating that island utopia is not so far away from the mainstream. So now I would like to come to the final shorter part of my talk and the question of utopian practices today. If utopian thought emphasizes the quest for more radical forms of democracy, I would argue that all experiences today with democratic decision-making, 
and with the acute awareness of power relations and communication can be a form of utopian practice. It tries out new ways of de democratic governance. For example, those informed by feminism and by anti-racism, critically pointing out the dominance of white male vo voices, attempting to counter this in hegemonic discourses, but also in the practices of political activism, constantly reflecting on internal hierarchies which might go unseen and trying to ensure non-authoritarian forms of communication. Also experimenting with organizing without hierarchies of power, but on the basis of collective decision making. In this sense, political activism has a function beyond its direct aims. It is a space of training, if you like, for utopian democracy. Utopian practices too. All examples of political organizing from below. That is, for example, organizing by refugees and migrants whose voices do not have a political space in the existing national democracies. Refugees and migrants mostly cannot vote. They are chiefly seen as either intruders in a racist discourse or as objects of our compassion and help, but not as political subjects in their own right and on an equal plane. Therefore, if they manage to make themselves heard in the political realm, this can be seen as a utopian extension of the political sphere, a path towards an understanding of democracy which would not be based on national exclusions. Utopian practices three, all demands related to a politicization of the economy. These include all struggles by workers, all strikes, be it for higher pay or better working conditions in general. They make the way work is organized a political issue and potentially threaten the power relations between capital and the working class. If they manage to form alliances or even to take companies under workers' control, this is already a trace of the possibility of a different economic organization. Currently, for instance, I would like to mention the demand to put energy companies into public ownership. I'm aware of this, especially in the UK and in Germany. These demands have the aim of democratic decision-making with reference to energy as a common good. This is different from demanding state ownership. It relates to the notion of democratic planning because of climate catastrophe, as well as the threat of dwindling resources currently amplified through the Ukraine war. So it is related to radical demands for a political, sustainable planning of the energy sector, not politics as we tend to know them today influenced by the interests of large corporations, maybe even corrupt, but politics for a social and environmentally sustainable alternative. These ideas are connected to demands of putting the fight against climate catastrophe before the business interests of competing private companies. This would be possible through the so socialization of energy companies, which could then focus on balancing energy requirements and sustainability without having to calculate profits in a market based on competition. Utopian practices four. All claims to decision making from below, involving diverse state stakeholders, such as in this example, environmental groups and researchers, organizations concerned with the protection of cultural heritage, as well as NGOs organizing around social concerns. As Movement Graffiti writes here, such decision-making would replace decisions made in favor of the commercial interests of a few catering for the wealthy. These are the decisions the capitalist system structurally prioritizes. Instead, land use should be based on public decisions rather than on politics for the private gain of companies or politics for direct private gain, such as building one's own swimming pool. Instead, transparent and democratic processes, considering the viewpoints of all stakeholders and treating land as a common good. Does this sound utopian? I would say it is utopian in the sense of being unrealistic only under the present dystopian conditions where profit-making rules and politics are often democratic only by name. If political activists in all these contexts and more develop an understanding not as fighting endless separate struggles within the existing system, but as in their separate struggles, ultimately fighting together for something new, something utopian, in the sense that it transcends the existing political economy of capitalism and its power relations, then these practices are utopian in a positive sense. <laughs> 
And I believe that this is a development already happening and worthy of becoming stronger. Thank you very much. Thank you.